Hey, what's up? It's Jesko again from AcousticsInsider.com where I teach home studio acoustic treatment techniques for audio professionals but without all the voodoo. I'm back for another video in my series with head audio. In this particular video, I want to talk to you guys about why speakers and subwoofers can sound so different when they actually measure the same. But before I get into that, just real quick, if you want to watch the rest of the videos in this series, have a look at the link in the card now. And if you are in the market for a new speaker, a head speaker in particular, have a look at the link in the description. That's an affiliate link. If you buy through that, you will support me and Head Audio, obviously, at no extra cost to you. So with that, let's jump right into this question. So why do speakers and subwoofers, speakers in general, why can they sound so different when the stats, the measurements, the characteristics, the data is so similar? So just imagine a two-way speaker, like with a six inch or a seven inch driver, in comparison to, let's say a big three-way, four-way, whatever, big speaker with a 12 inch drive unit, but both of them have the same frequency response and play at the same SPL, why is it that the bigger speaker is just gonna push and kick like a mule in comparison to the little speaker that just sounds muffled and cramped and, and tight? What's, what's up with that? To answer that question, I'm gonna do things a little differently in this video. I'm gonna go talk to Klaus Heinz. You've seen me bring him into a video previously. He is the former CEO of Head Audio, but at the proud age of 75 years, he decided to take a step back and give over the reins to the next generation to manage the company so he can really focus on research and development. He's been designing speakers for decades and he is largely responsible and also known for bringing air motion transformers into the world, otherwise known as ribbon tweeters, which you can obviously see on head speakers and nowadays many other speakers as well. And just another small tidbit of information, his father was Ernst Ruska, a Nobel Prize winner and co-inventor of the electron microscope, just to show you how much legacy there is in his family. But more importantly, he's just a really fun, a humble, just a really nice guy. Obviously very, very knowledgeable. And going back to the original question, I wanted to bring him in obviously to talk about all the nerdy detail stuff, but also to just feature him a little bit and to allow you guys to get to know him a little bit better. So with that, let's not waste any more time and go talk to Klaus Heinz. Klaus, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for taking the time. What a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. Um, obviously, the topic today is going to be talking about why speakers and subwoofers as well can sound so different when they measure the same. We're just going to use that as yeah. a starting point for this conversation. I know you have a lot of inter interesting things to say about this. And I'm, Hopefully. <laughs> I'm very much looking forward to getting into the details. You touched on quite a few of these aspects already in um, into interviews we you did with Darko Audio a few years back. Mm -hmm. And for everybody watching now, I highly recommend you watch those videos as well. I'll link them below. So what I want to really do is um, pick up to some extent to where you left off with, uh, with him um, mm -hmm. at the time. But even before that, I really want to take a step back and kind of introduce you a bit more as a person. I think yeah. that uh, got a bit short up to now. Uh, we, you have a very rich history, uh, I think, and <laughs> that is worth uh, getting into a bit, being an Ur-Berliner, a native Berliner, yeah. uh, growing up in this city. And um, so I want to give people uh, a chance to get to know you a little better. Mm -hmm. So um, the first kind of question that I really want to ask you is, little birds around the company told me that you are a very passionate piano player. Um, so I guess at this point you've been playing for 20, 30, 40 years, maybe? That's a not so nice question. It's actually like 55 years. 55 <laughs> years, there you go. Wow, okay. Yeah. And so what I always find interesting is, is how experiences from those, from that, those uh, creative processes feed back into what we do professionally, right? Mm -hmm. For me, 
Uh, it's, I played the piano for nine years as well, which is not nearly 55, but uh, <laughs> definitely <laughs> some time. Mm -hmm. And for example, in my case, uh, I noticed that I have a very, very sense, I'm very sensitive to pitch nowadays, which really helps me with my mixing abilities. Yeah. How, how does your experience, how has your experience, your, your passion for playing the piano impacted what you do professionally with speakers? Um, what have you taken away? Where do those merge, come together? It's not the case that one is built upon the other, mm -hmm. but of course they help each other. And I started with piano playing like around 20, uh, nearly 20 only, so too late to, to become a real pian <laughs> piano player. Right but uh, with some passion and, and enjoying it a lot. Another instrumental experience that played a role for 10 years was playing the organ in churches. Oh, right, okay. And I was here in, uh, in Berlin where I went to school. It started a little bit and uh, afterwards. And then I was in Stuttgart for two, three years to, to study physics later in, in Berlin. And uh, in for 10 years I had, a, I had a job as an organ player in a Catholic church. Right, wow, okay. And uh, I, again, I wouldn't call me a, an organist because I didn't have the, the, uh, the skills and the, the education for it. But uh, it was practical to earn money, to speak frankly, and I had a Catholic education, so I knew the details <laughs> of what, what to play. And uh, that was an, an ongoing status, which ended then when I was around 30. And already there, I enjoyed, of course, the kind of deep tones an organ is, is going to reproduce. And I got a tick for a while when I was 22, 3, 4. That means I traveled around and uh, tried to get on each and every organ bank that I could reach. And uh, for example, I managed to reach the one in St. Florian in Österreich. Mm -hmm. That's is where Bruckner has been born. And to honor him, they have made a very special organ there which has a so-called 64-foot register. So the deepest contra uh, E is a uh, 16 hertz tone, something wow. the hi-fi loudspeaker uh, people uh, insist We're to have in oh, their right. speakers. You know. Right. We're still chasing to, to some extent. That is a pipe where four people can be uh, located in. That's crazy. Yeah. And um, I had a, an energy that I've totally lost to overwhelm pastors and administrators <laughs> of churches and to just get there, you know. Sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I sat there and had this subcontra E and, and pressed it again and again. Yeah. And uh, what happens is that f in the very first moment, it bloop, when the air goes into this huge pipe and then nothing. And after some while, you experience that the room is in quiet in a way or another. Yeah. And if you stop it, then you feel free. So it is, it is an effect. It has to do with pressure, with, with in quiet atmosphere, so to yeah. say. And in the end, it's a psychological effect. If, if you uh, step in and you have a, a big accord and this kind of quality texture, down there, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. I, I would say it's psychological uh, war, uh, war <laughs> yeah. detail. Uh, to impress people and to, to get their soul by shaking up the body a little bit, yeah. So, organ was an important thing for me for a while. And um, uh, later on, I, I yeah, couldn't do it anymore because physics, in a way, terminated religious ambitions. So okay. To say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, sure. Yeah, and um, so uh, piano playing was a second row for a while, but to, to play instrument or to, to listen to classical music in many, many concerts at least gave a sense of how instruments and singers really sound. Mm -hmm. So it's known that the ear has a very bad memory, so it's, it's not much worth in the beginning. After 10 years, 20, maybe 50 years, something remains as, as, as an idea of what is natural as what is not natural. It's like an impression really, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Very Still, I never would dare to judge a speaker without having a comparison for an A-B comparison. Mm -hmm. But those two things together to have at the same level, skill, uh, especially carefully made, the, the, the level has to be matched very carefully to not to be become victim of the loudest speaker. Plus the experience of the of the uh, classical music together, make it 
make it more probable that I'm right. In the beginning, I always was very nervous with a new speaker, what would people say and so on. After all these years, the chance to make mistakes is less. That's right. what I would claim, yeah. yeah right, right. <laughs> so, and that's what it's, it's useful for, to have the Excellent. experience of natural instruments and, and orchestras. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a lot about about uh, about confidence in your work as well, I guess. In, in the not in the beginning, not in yeah. the first decades. I yeah. have to say that it was always a very nervous situation. Yeah. With, with come, uh, if so rather, speaker so, was so rather the lack of lack of confidence at the beginning, but then and there were bad surprises. Mm -hmm. Not that many, but there were one, and you are as nervous as you can be yeah. because it's like. In that case, it's like an artist. If you present yourself and you sing sure. and you do a mistake, hey, come on, that's personal. Yeah. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, that way. Excellent. Yeah, very, very interesting. Thank you. Um, and and going back to to your your Berliner days, the kind of the next question that I really I'm really curious is uh, curious about is your surroundings shape how you get introduced to things right and growing up in the city berlin being yeah. a divide, divided city for the longest yeah. time yeah. how did how did that impact how you how music or loudspeakers in particular listening to loudspeakers how you were introduced to that so yeah. if it, maybe it's a bit of a far stretch but um, i have to admit that at the end of my uh, studies i uh, had a small shop where i sold some hi-fi stuff uh -huh, uh, uh -huh. called audio level yeah. and um, there, people showed up who would, were do-it-yourselfers or who had interest in loudspeakers. And I developed an uh, early ambition that in my hi-fi studio, the three most important speakers of the world could be heard. Right. Nowhere else, like okay. Infinity Servo Static, a huge s electrostatical system, a clipshorn, and a magnet pan, which are thin walls of making music, which okay. were very hot at that okay, point okay. in time. <laughs> yeah. And it was a pleasure to, to have these comparisons of the different speakers and people enjoying it. It was a time where a student defined his existence by the size of his speakers that he sure. had in his, his, his <laughs> uh, room. Sure. And so these things fitted together and that would, that it's probable that that happens more often in Berlin than elsewhere. That's what I still right. think, yeah. And um, so that was a giving and taking. And um, then I had a, a good luck because I sold uh, many speakers for one of those, uh, for the Infinity guys. And there was a nice uh, distributor here in Germany and he took me to a journey to the US, which led to the fact that I learned to know quite a number of the famous guys of the early hi-fi. Mm -hmm. For example, we visited Paul Klipsch in mm. his, his small town where, where the factory was. And I saw him on the bench there uh, being uh, occupied by or being or handling a, a horn-like small speaker. Full of honor, I asked, what are you doing there? <laughs> and yeah, it's a bell telephone horn and I don't understand this detail. And it was always a little bit. Bullshit like that okay, was okay. The, the vocabulary he introduced into the high fever world. Bullshit, everything. <laughs> right. And um, yeah, then um, I thought myself with 73, that's what he was at that point in time, I, I shouldn't be in the lab anymore. The very truth is that I'm 75, <laughs> I'm still there. <laughs> Full circle. Yeah. yeah. And um, then after, uh, visit, uh, after the visit well, was ended, um, we were in the countryside, uh, Paul Klipsch took a small airplane, a private airplane, okay. and the elderly gentleman sat there, first massaged his hands before he started the airplane, <laughs> and then we, with the Cessna, we got to the next airport. That's the way the Americans live, and it was impressive enough at least, and I saw the Infinity guy and um, uh, SIE and the amplifier people at that point in time. So I got an got the air of, of what hi-fi was or where hi-fi was meaningful in the US at the West mm -hmm. Coast US. There were the big guys who had the new ideas that shook up the market and uh, latest uh, or then I was a total nut. Okay. <laughs> so far, so that, at that point I guess. Had yeah, yeah. It was, really, it, it was really uh, you got the bug. Uh, to stay there. Yeah, that was the, was the aim. Right, right. Okay. And um, then uh, later on, or maybe it's too fast, um, I, I met Oscar Heil, as mentioned before. I was just going to say, obviously that then and introduced me to Oscar One of the early, Heil, yeah. early, early exhibitions with my first company, Arcus, which mm -hmm. was a hi-fi company. 
And uh, then Oscar showed his system in, at the Berlin Funkschau, a Funkausstellung. And there we learn to know each other and uh, some pictures where he looks at my Ionic Twitter at that point in time. <laughs> and that was uh, um, a good event for me. Uh, in the beginning, frankly speaking, I didn't really understand how this thing <laughs> would work. And later on I did and um, tried uh, to ap approach him to do it a little bit different. But at that point in time, patents were pending and the ESS people who came up with the first AMT1 loudspeaker uh, were not willing, or Oscar was not willing, I don't know. And um, later on, when, when the patent had expired, I thought that it was important to, to correct three, I found three basic uh, shortcomings okay. of the construction. This is now talking about the AMT, the, the air AMT motion one, transformer. The classical air motion transformer. That Oscar Heil has, developed has originally and you Oscar. kind of got fascinated with. Yeah. That's it. Mm -hmm. And if, if you have a picture uh, of that bulky tweeter, then you saw that in front of the diaphragm there was a V-shaped uh, magnetic uh, structure. Mm -hmm. So if you take me as my original Klaus Heinz that I am and you listen to this here furthermore, you right. have a coloration, although it's still me. Yeah. So no speaker can work with such a geometry in front of it uh, without coloration. And that's f I've found to be removed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, second, the dispersion characteristic of these speakers were very uh, crazy, uh, in what way? unusual because again because of the geometry. Right. So, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, to make it more universal was a, was another aim or goal. And uh, last not least, it was an American speaker. Um, that means it, how we're going to fix it anyhow. And it was not regular. The technical data changed from piece to piece in a in a difficult manner, <laughs> so right. to say. For example, we found between 4 and 12 ohms in resistance for the diaphragm, which is a um, totally changing thing there. Okay, okay. And, um, but it was a, a lucky thing to, to have met this idea and to, to come up with a compact version of it, practically, that uh, later on in Adam Audio, uh, was introduced to the professional world with some success and then yeah, absolutely. I felt uh, happy with it. Yeah. That's a, a very humble way to say things. I think you yeah. probably introduced the AMT to the world, broadly yeah. speaking. Well, he yeah. might have come up with the idea, but you really s spread it, right? The, the goal of <coughs> the small tweeter was to replace domes. That means to have all the advantages of a dome, like being small, like being not a dipole, but a monopole. Uh, and to, to not to lose in any of the classical disciplines like a bandwidth, uh, a, um, harmonic distortion, efficiency, all these things. There have been many special constructions in the history of speakers, but always they lacked in one, two or three parameters of those just mentioned. And uh, so all in all, they didn't have success. And the AMT was endangered to have the same fate and uh, remain an audiophile corner where a few people would enjoy it. And I think this way the principle has gained air, gained uh, uh, progress in, in, in the hi-fi world and professional world. And um, yeah, that was a coming together that I enjoyed and still yeah. enjoy. And just taking things back to Oscar Heil, you mentioned that he wasn't terribly impressed with the ideas, the new ideas that you had for the AMT when you presented it to him. Before I did that, I visited him a few times yeah. uh, south of San Francisco, where he had his home and his lab. And uh, it uh, were interesting discussions because Oscar was a physicist and uh, he was born in 06. So his PhD he made was uh, when it was 28, 29 in Göttingen. And that was the capital of the scientific world at that yeah. point in time, both for quantum mechanics, for mathematics. The, the, the most brilliant heads were, were over there, Heisenberg, other ones. And he was, of course, proud. And uh, yes, he could be proud of being uh, part of this process. Uh, and um, besides being a scientist, he always uh, liked engineering and he always was a speaker nut. Right. Just right from the beginning, I tell you. He had a special, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, special love to, to speakers yeah. as well. And uh, let me take another three minutes to, to uh, go the way from his main invention to, to the tweeters. Sure. At that point in time, uh, tubes 
tube amplifiers were not, not hi-fi, I mean tube amplifiers in general were not able to, to transmit very high frequencies in the megahertz area. And Oscar invented the Klystron, which is, a, which is an uh, amplifier design that made a leap forward in, okay. in so far. Mm -hmm. And I knew he did. Mm -hmm. I had a rough idea what it was, but it's only like three, four years when I recognized, oh my God, that was a tweeter already. Because, <laughs> because a klystron works with condenser plates where the electron beams are formed. Mm -hmm. And when you form them, when you put them together, they increase velocity. Yes. Mm -hmm. So up, yeah. mm -hmm. in today's hi-fi vocabulary that is an air motion transforming yes. process and it's the same thing he did with air and, and, and diaphragms um, in the AMT. So that was a very old idea just cleverly re rethought and how much of a speaker nut he was uh, may be illustrated uh, by uh, the question, well, by, by the information you gave me, yeah, dome tweeters you have invented in Germany in the 60s. That's what we think about Heiko and Brown, which, uh, who, who actually did that. Uh, but I did that in the 30s already. Mm -hmm. Oh, how did you do? And um, that I took a, a Stopfpilzwandbund in Germany, a wooden uh, uh, metal a cap. Yeah, maybe. Uh, that's what women used to repair clothes. Ah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and stopped pills. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And a little, little pillow, pillow mushroom sort of thing. Yeah, it's yeah. like a dome. It's, it's a, a segment of a, of a mm -hmm. ball and uh, with a wooden grip so that you can repair uh, mm -hmm. clothes. And on that, uh, he put a nylon uh, stocking from, from his mother. And on that, he put egg white. And then he dispersed it baited until it was hard, then he had applied a voice coil, and that was his dome tweeter wow. in the 30s. Wow. So always on its way, the guy, you know. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> yeah, way ahead of its time. Mm -hmm. And the most famous thing he actually, or the more, most important thing he did, um, that in the, he formulated the field effect transistor. Okay. And years later, Seven years later, other people realized it. Yeah, and they sure. got the Nobel Prize for it. But the formulation of how to make a field effect transistor where sure. where electrons are guided by field mm -hmm. and not by the resistor of the uh, PNP uh, was a, gr a great idea and it is not a, a saying. I saw the patent, he showed me the patent that he applied for Telefunken and uh, but he didn't do it unfortunately. Then he would have been totally famous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Crazy how people uh, miss, miss uh, or yeah. pa pass by certain yeah. opportunities, yeah. right? And there's a story about the guy who invented the tea bag that goes so, so, in a similar So way. we had a lot to talk uh, yeah. and, and I waited for the day when the patent would expire to come up with different ideas. When uh, there actually was time to do that, I uh, traveled another time uh, to him and said, here, look at that. Nah, he said, that's not the way to do it. And he was intrigued by the approach and uh, um, with some discussion uh, we yeah. separated um, uh, he do, was do you know why he didn't like the idea was it just pride you know, in the end meanwhile i'm an old man by myself so i would have the idea that somebody else in mm. interfering with your invention is not welcome yeah <laughs> but that didn't stop it's, you it's that simple it's that simple yeah, yeah. I, I regretted it a lot because before all the sure. discussions were free and wonderful mm -hmm. and, and at that point it was limited and unfortunately, like two or three years later, he already died. So I very much would have liked to present him the, the sure. success of the whole affair and have a better discussion afterwards. Sure. <laughs> I'm yeah. sure if, if, uh, if he had let go, if he, if he could let go of his pride now and he'd see what you have done with his original idea, you would probably be very happy, I would assume. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, maybe at that point, let's segue yeah. into more detailed stuff, yeah. talking about actual measurements, the limitations of measurements, yeah. how that compares to how we hear speakers. And uh, I just want to mention, or I'm going to paraphrase something you said in a previous interview. Um, measurements these days only serve to avoid common mistakes, you said, or to get right what is commonly known to be reasonable to make a good speaker, right? So frequency yeah. response, dispersion, um, a distortion, those things. But you said they don't tell you at all how a speaker sounds, right? So maybe as a, as a jumping off point, very broad question, what does then tell us how a speaker sounds and why can't we measure it? Yeah, I, I would like to be 
to get fundamental. Yes, now. please, <laughs> Un unbedingt, absolutely. It's more than to be a fundamentalist, is it? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, the question is, what is to be measured and what do we measure? Mm -hmm. What is to be measured is a sound field that emanates from a speaker into different direction with individual patterns for middle, high, low frequencies and with reflections of the room and a sound field that can be described with million of points, whatever ambition you have as an electrical engineer. Infinite number of points, really. In, in yeah. the end, infinite. Yeah. And um, all these particles are not uh, static. They move. They are vector, natural, have a vector, rise natu nature. So and a direction so and you have angle. a mm -hmm. huge, <laughs> so vivid event, the sound field in a room, that you measure with a microphone on one position and the output of the microphone is a voltage, is a pure number. So all the richness that started the thing is lost to 99,999% yeah. and uh, that is the ground situation. Mm -hmm. we, we have a lot of limitations between the sound field and the simple numbers that are the output of the microphone and maybe the most important one is that those numbers have no time dimension. Mm -hmm. It is a graph mm -hmm. that you have. Sound field only is a sound field if it moves. You cannot have a sound field without movement. So the dimension of time is lost. The richness of the different events in the room are lost and everything is condensed to a very small amount of data. A very so simplified you should number, be yeah. suspicious. Mm -hmm. That's the beginning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you should be very suspicious. And um, mathematically, uh, one, could, one could call it a projection. If you have uh, an event and you have the shadow on, on the wall, then you have a projection. You have no chance to learn from the shadow what has happened before and in which way the shadow has come to existence. Mm -hmm. That's the mm -hmm. same is true for microphones. And uh, one has, of course, tried to eliminate a few of those shortcomings. In the beginning, which uh, something most of you will, will be uh, familiar with, is, is an anechoic room. So at least all the reflections from the, zoom, from the room could be rather successfully removed. And uh, so we could say, aha, what I measure in one meter of distance from the tweeter is really the speaker only and not the room. Mm -hmm. That is one parameter solved. Um, other things stay in place as a confusion. So the directivity of loudspeakers changes with frequency. That means if you have a, a low tone like 100 hertz, it's uh, uh, going into each and every direction the same way. And the higher it goes, the smaller the angle gets where you have the same sound pressure level, which is for important for your ear. And this is a diagram that shows the effect here. This goes from low to higher frequencies. And here we have zero degree. That means where the microphone normally is positioned. So you see, the higher you get, the narrower the angle becomes where the same kind of sound pressure level can be perceived. A microphone that stands here in the middle is totally innocent with respect to all these effects. Yeah, it doesn't register them. Yeah. It doesn't uh, record them. Yeah, mm -hmm. And um, so we, we lose directivity information. Mm -hmm. If you have two speakers with the same frequency response to go to the main issue, yes. and one has a very broad, a broad directivity in the tweeter, mm -hmm. then the acoustic energy in the high frequencies is apparently much higher and your ear is not responding to frequency response but to acoustic energy. Your, your, um, your ear is squaring the signal so you lose phase information. Mm -hmm. Some people say you don't hear phase, another, another issue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's squaring it so that it becomes uh, energy and um, that is more sensitive to what you hear than the, th the sound field only that as described before. And so one escape the engineers were seeking was to have hall rooms. Mm -hmm. That is just the opposite from an anechoic room. It is a room with non-parallel walls with a very hard surface so that if you say, hey, you have three, four, five seconds where you can still listen it. But if you integrate the signal over time, then you really measure the energy 
and you come to similar but different curves. And um, it corresponds to what we physically uh, receive in the ear a mm -hmm. little bit more. On the other side, one loses some information as well with all the echoes, of course, sure. in between. Yeah. It was it's not modern anymore. Uh, whole rooms we we know about the other things. We know enough about the other things to not to be uh, depending on these whole rooms anymore. Yeah. But so it's basically all everything that you described is 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 looking at very specific aspects and yeah. trying to get as close to the reality of that sound field, the original sound field, as possible. But we're not even not even remotely getting close, right? It's what we can do. Yeah, it's what we, we can do. We, we would like to do more, uh, yeah. but, but uh, in practice, the one meter anechoic measurement has replaced each and everything else. And there are some reasons to not to be desperate about it. But, yeah. <laughs> but let me come up with, with, an, with another problem. If I have my one meter microphone on the height of the tweeter, that's what the recommendation mm -hmm. between the people is. And here we have uh, some frequency response. The red one is our one meter normal uh, tweeter height measurement. Mm -hmm. And then if you go to 10, 20, 30 degrees off axis, to the side, you'll yeah. see that middle high gets less and less and less. Yeah. And that's the experience we have. If you don't sit in front of the speaker, then on the side, then we'll have less high frequency uh, sure. reception. So now imagine a two-way speaker mm -hmm. that we are just talking about and having these measurements on hand. Mm -hmm. Now we turn it 90 degrees mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. and do the same thing some catastrophic frequency responses will occur. Yeah. So that is another indicator that the one meter measurement in the, in the height of the tweeter is more than incomplete. It's, yeah. it's just one point. Yeah. So, and um, I could continue, but I should come to the other uh, aspects now, that the, uh, the imperfection of the, of the measurement are dramatic that the measured issue is dramatically more complex than the, what the results, simple numbers, show you. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, again, mistrust uh, and being cautious about the measurement is a very good, good um, uh, recommendation. In earlier times, when the measurement became possible, people were so f frenetic about that they could measure something that it was linear, linear in itself was a wonderful world that um, replaced the real discussion. No, no, okay. this is linear. Yeah. You know, that, and this everything is, is so clear. You don't yes. ask more questions. Yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. 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 We've reached our goal. Mm -hmm. no. And um, in the last 10, 20 years, measurement uh, uh, intelligence has been really uh, improved an awful lot. Um, uh, so one knows more with wonderful systems like Clipple and uh, mm -hmm. uh, Audio Precision, those are guys who make refined, the most refined measurement setups and so on. Still, I would claim if I get a set of curves, I have no clue. I don't, it's not only that I don't know exactly, I have no clue how this speaker sounds. And I think the perfect example is a common question that I get is why does a two-way system with a seven, six-inch woofer with the same frequency response and at the same SPL yeah. sound completely different to a much bigger speaker mm -hmm. with a, I don't know, 12-inch yeah. drive unit with yeah. the same frequency response and same SPL, right? Where, where is the difference then, right? The difference does lie in the um, patterns that go into the room. The microphone, as mentioned, is innocent mm -hmm. with respect to the patterns. Only if mm -hmm. you have different positions, then you get a clearer side. And um, the other thing is the dynamics, because mm -hmm. speakers have more dynamic. That's what people always hear. Me too. Yet it is difficult to give a measurement reason why the dynamic is a uh, different dynamic can be heard. Just, just can, can I quickly intervene to, to just to understand what you mean by dynamic in this context? Good idea. We're talking, yeah. we're talking about how well the the driver can follow the actual signal it, it, it's supposed to play, right? How accurately he can follow that? Accurate and how linear he does so. So if yeah. I have double the voltage, I would like to have double the the output uh, in, uh, in in the acoustic area. Yeah. 
And uh, if one makes these measurements, then there are not many differences to be found. Astonishingly enough, I'm yeah. still wondering. And uh, also yet because the testing signal is probably too simplified, right? It's the, the that would be one of the possible explanations. Right? It absolutely. doesn't represent yeah. the actual uh, complexity of music that is then played yeah. that we want to play uh, at all, right? Yeah, a confusing thing insofar mm -hmm. is that uh, if you make a normal sine wave, you are able with a Fourier transform to calculate the impulse response. Mm -hmm. So from this whoop, you see like a uh, it's just by calculation. Mm -hmm. And there are uh, some more transformations that allow to have a different aspects onto what has happened. Still, in these aspects, you don't see why the knock of a 2 times 18 inch <laughs> loudspeaker is slightly different from a Bluetooth smallie yeah. that uh, has the same frequency response. If you cut the big guys, for example, yeah, yeah, that is a uh, worse further uh, investigation, and it is another warning to not uh, to believe that you know something about the sound of a speaker if you have this nice frequency response that you want to see. Yeah, it needs. It needs a listening test. This is not a cheap uh, explanation of an, <coughs> of an loudspeaker R&D guy who wants mm -hmm. <laughs> to be important. No, actually that is always a new experience if you have it together and then you can optimize it for the classical disciplines like linearity, like directivity, like distortion. But without your own sound impression, you should not start because the it's in German, one would say it's not hinreichend. Yeah, uh, it's, it's not it's sufficient. It's not mm, sufficient. It, it, it's not a clear answer to the sound. Mm -hmm. It's nearly no qu uh, answer at all. Mm -hmm, <laughs> and mm -hmm. That's what I have to emphasize on that with all the wonderful measurement uh, equipment. And I loved uh, to use all, all with the newest measurement equipment because it's interesting. Yeah? Sure. But it's not. It can also obviously reveal problems. Of course. Um, in a way that might be difficult to, to hear. But it doesn't have the content of is the music right. Yeah. 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 And I mean, so we're, we're really what we're trying to say is the, um, the measurements rep show us a, a, a part of the world of the complexity of yeah. the sound field, but it is a small part yeah. and we're, we use it to the best of our ability to, to get those things right. Yeah. But then there's a whole world beyond that that we can't <laughs> measure, right? Yeah. And there are certain things also that we we can measure, but we tend not to, at least not in the sort of this, the, that set yeah. of typical data. For example, talking about materials, yeah. stiffness of the membrane, for example. Yeah. And so those are things, maybe let's just stick with that for the moment. So those yeah. are things we can measure yeah. in, in other ways, yeah. but we probably don't, to the, they don't form part of the typical data set. Yeah, one of the more advanced measurement methods is um, uh, for, for diaphragms is to have their mechanical behavior reproduced. The, the cone is not a cone always, but for higher frequencies it starts to work mm -hmm. in itself. And there are very nice simulations and measurements possible to preview it, even to calculate physically the frequency response it will make later on. Mm -hmm. And um, the same uh, problem occurs. So if those curves look different, if there are different uh, f colors on the diaphragm, it moves a little bit and says, how does it sound? Yeah. Let's go to the studio. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. uh, that's the only answer possible. Again, if you have a mistake and you need a flat piston-like action, that's a natural uh, goal, of course, and, and you manage to avoid that more or less, then those curves help a lot. Then the, because the goal is clear, but um, Again, the sound is not reversible, recognizable mm. for, 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 the, for the engineer. Yeah. And that, that again shows also that the, the goal of what we're trying to achieve isn't something that we, we define by the data. We, we use the data to make sure we've reached the goal, yeah. but we've originally defined the goal through extensive listening tests, through decades of of experience. The goal is not unique, is not clearly defined. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you read that a pulsating sphere would be the ideal. Okay. That is not at all true for monitor speakers because uh, we want to have uh, the room impression from the recording mm -hmm. and not from the room that I listen in, uh, mm -hmm. where I listen. So that is a non-ideal ideal, if I may say so, yeah. And um, to have, a, let me call it a reasonable directivity behavior, uh, that's something 
uh, one knows better about uh, after all these listening experiences and articles that have been written about it, uh, that is uh, not a clear goal. Uh, a nice, a rational directivity response is conversation. It's yeah. not a clear goal, yeah. right? It's and kind of like, eh, yet it helps, sort of it helps to make things comparable. Yeah. And really good loudspeakers have a, a similar behavior insofar. Meanwhile, this mm -hmm. is an objective for the last 20 years. Where one, uh, when, uh, where people moved away from frequency only to frequency plus directivity to get a better impression of what kind of acoustic energy mm -hmm. is emanate is, is sent to the room. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I mean, we just as a disclaimer, obviously, at this point, we're literally talking mainly about just uh, characterizing this unit alone through these through this data. We're not even talking so much about what it does in the room yet, mm -hmm. to some extent. But yeah, okay. uh, but uh, right at the moment we're just looking at this, this units, yeah. yeah. All the stuff that I tend to talk about in my videos, we're not even discussing at this point. Yeah. Yeah? So um, so there's also that, right? And then uh, finding the most interesting thing, just to show how limit limiting measure measurements are or data in the measurements are, is that there are aspects to the quality of a sound field that we literally don't have any numbers for. Yeah. yeah, for any example, any idea, any goal in the correct sense. Uh, yeah, I mean, we were discussing this before, sense, yeah. so, so clarity or, or detail in the stereo image, how well you can pinpoint certain instruments yeah. in the stereo image that gets formed when you set up two speakers in a stereo yeah. system or you get some sort of uh, stereo effect. That's, yeah. Yeah, let, let me shortly comment on, yeah, on, the, on the face problem uh, of loudspeakers. Loudspeakers, all loudspeakers, passive and active ones, necessarily and inevitably do phase changes. Mm -hmm. From the harmonic analysis, we know that wherever a frequency shift or, uh, occurs, a phase shift occurs by, by uh, fundamental physics, and, uh, not, not to be, uh, not to be uh, inevitably, that's what I mean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so necessarily loudspeakers who do frame the frequency response by their constructions, by the filters and so on, they do have a phase Errors, which means that typically uh, there is an increasing delay uh, in the direction of lower frequencies, which leads to the effect that if you have a ground tone in a musical event, mm -hmm. that the overtones, the overtones the harmonics, yeah. have mm -hmm. a timely delay. Mm -hmm. The ear is not very sensible for it. There has been many articles and, and scientific work to, uh, to understand the uh, receiving behavior of the, uh, the properties of the ear in mm -hmm. so far with respect to time. However, it is a change. It is wrong in the sense of the original signal. Right. And that uh, could be uh, room for discussion, of course. But um, to correct this aspect is helpful to make the better speaker. That yeah. is no question. Yeah. That's what we did with the, with the uh, linearizer here. And now we can claim that down to 50 hertz, these phase relationships are kept the way they are coming in. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were, of course, uh, keen to see what it makes, what it what it means for for the frequency in practice, for the, yeah, for, how the, for, the, for the listening experience. Yeah, how does it actually sound? Yeah. And uh, we had good effects. We had less uh, evident effects as well. And then, in, in opening uh, experience, was to take all classical uh, recordings mm -hmm. that are runtime stereophony based. Mm -hmm. So there, the natural timely behavior of the original concert hall was represented and with intention, that was what it was based on. That's the recording technique. Yeah, mm -hmm. when at that point, I'm, and it, it, with these recordings, the, the spatial impression was improved an awful lot. Mm -hmm. That means the original phase behavior was transferred to a better degree and that helped to have a, a nicer, much nicer room impression. Yeah. If a modern recording is made on the mixing console with a lot of detail filters, that change phase as well, and so on, mm -hmm. then there is no original that can be matched by the loudspeaker. It is not acoustically, it's not naturally mm -hmm. so. So that is a, is a good experience we made whilst uh, developing the linearizer. Mm -hmm. And But again, the, the fact that the, the phase plot suddenly looks flat doesn't tell us in exact numbers how much better the sound becomes you said it you said it yourself I right it's, not it sounds dared. better but how we can describe that with certain subjective attributes but that's about it right what we can say is that statistically speaking 
it is recognized yeah. in a regular basis. This is recognized by the customers. We have enough comments and, and uh, responsive behavior from, from uh, customers that says it is received as the better sound. Yeah. That's for sure. You have in, in older uh, scientific books, there is an opinion that the ear is not sensitive to phase information. Mm -hmm. And that there's a good reason for it. By squaring the signal, phase information is lost if you take it mathematically only. And yet something else happens that makes us uh, sensitive for phase yeah. response. Yeah. Yeah. And once again, this becomes, hope maybe this becomes in the long term one of those um, goals, yeah. just like that we like a, uh, a, a, a mainly linear dispersion characteristic in order to excite the room yeah. homogeneously, let's say. Maybe this becomes another one of those goals that isn't, it's not clearly defined a dangerous exactly goal why. Because the next room might look different yeah. from the speaker. So yeah. that is a and I mean, that's one of the things that makes my job in mm. building studios so difficult, yeah. right? Because there is no one correct room. It's all like the goal isn't hard set. It is defined by by listening experience, and that over time, with many many ex experiments, has shown to be st statistically significant or 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 to to be true for most people. Right? Mm. That's how we we ultimately define those goals that we then pursue. Yeah. With amongst other things, the measurements. That's a similarity be between you and my work. Yeah. We, we, we need measurements to not to make mistakes, yeah. but we cannot deliver the, the real work with it. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a great kind of uh, a point to maybe finish this conversation as mm -hmm. well. But as a, as a last question to you, uh, just out of curiosity, with the experience you have, where you, where you started, how much, where you've come, what you've mm -hmm. come to now, Looking to the future, 10, 20 years perhaps, what, what do you think might be a, a, a technology, a concept, an implementation in speakers um, that we are starting to see now that might become the norm in 10 or 20 years? I rather would be able to, to formulate goals, Please. but I don't see a, a totally different technology coming around the okay. corner. Mm -hmm. The progress in speakers for the next 10 years I presume will be materials. Mm -hmm. There are better uh, diaphragm materials uh, that we could think of, but all the magnetic uh, circuitry and the TLS small parameters are well known since 30 years. There is, uh, if an engineer does a good work, that's it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no no big invention to be expected. And um, so materials are the near field mm -hmm. <laughs> goal, so to say, and. Um, uh, the digital digital um, tricks mm -hmm. will increase for room simulation, for, to co for correcting speaker uh, mistakes. Mm -hmm. Second order nonlinearities can be handled with dynamic processor uh, algorithms and so on. There is, there is still some room, but um, uh, the ma one of the main shortcomings of speaker, which is a scandal in the green times we are living in, okay. is their efficiency. Okay. Efficiency of a speaker is uh, Major uh, two percent, one to two percent. Oh yeah, okay. So that's nothing. Okay. You would not expect any machine today with that efficiency yeah, yeah, yeah. in your household. Yeah. And um, this is an indicator already of the biggest engineering goal I see. That is dynamics. Mm -hmm. We have nice frequency responses. We have phase. Okay. And um, when I go home in the evening and have time to to play uh, on my grand piano you I uh, just put one octave in the bass and you immediately know there's a lot of work to do because <laughs> <laughs> it, oh god it is it's just going to so stop right dynamic now dynamic and yeah. deep and the frequency mm -hmm. clear it has no no uh, uh, sky around it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it, so visceral. Yeah. It, mm -hmm. is, it is evident. It mm -hmm. is not a fine, uh, fine arts discussion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is evident. Mm -hmm. And a speaker should be able uh, one day to, to, to reproduce, uh, say, 50 to hertz upwards uh, um, in, in a non boxy, in a free way, and hopefully with a better efficiency. But we only know this electromagnetic uh, motor princi principle behind. and. 
and it, what can be done is done for today. You have the right. most wonderful uh, arrays there, and there is no big surprise around the corner that the efficiency can be changed. Big invitation for all the people who listen, do something about it. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, yeah. excellent. Maybe with that, let's leave it there. Okay. <laughs> Thank you again, Klaus. Thank you, Jeff. And thanks, everybody, for watching. Okay, to wrap things up, I hope that conversation was as interesting to you guys as it was to me. I, I really enjoyed talking to Klaus. I always do. When he gets comes out of his shell, it's, it's, a, it's so much fun to, to, to interact with him, to listen to him talk, to hear his stories. And I hope you got some of that as well. But more than that, on topic, what I really want you guys to take away here is that measurements aren't the end all be all, right? They, they are really important, don't get me wrong. And I understand that it's easy to kind of fall back to measurements, to kind of solid data when a lot of this is so untangible, it's so nebulous in a way. There's a reason why my slogan is acoustics without all the voodoo. But measurements are just a part of the scientific process and truth in science is only or only goes as far as scientific research has come. So with that, let me wrap up this video. One thing before I let you go, remember that I've got a brand new video workshop for you guys. This is the Phantom Speaker Test, how to set up your speakers correctly, no matter what room you're in. You can sign up to that for free at the link in the description. This is my step-by-step -step process to guide you through positioning your setup and setting up your speakers in your home studio. Oftentimes it can be difficult to kind of figure out where exactly to place your setup in your room, which wall to face, how far away you should place your speakers, how to make sure you're really getting everything out of your room and your speakers. That's what this video workshop is for. So once again, if you are setting up your studio, if you're setting up a new studio, you need to figure out where to start. I want you to sign up to my free video workshop, The Phantom Speaker Test, at the link in the description. And with that, let's get back to learning to trust our ears and having fun making music in the studio. See you soon.